We're going to get going. We have a lot action packed as always. You know, I jam everything in there, but we have a crowd favorite today, somebody who we get often requests to come and talk. And so we're going to get started. Um, as you know, we share our um, information. Um, we are a program of Public Health Institute, and we share all of our information through Creative Commons, and there will be a follow-up email with the links um, and the slide deck that we use today, so I just wanted to let you know. Go ahead. And so for the best experience, we just want to make sure that you don't cut out on us, you guys. So make sure you have plenty of power in your computer, close the necessary windows. Um, and really what's really important is check your chat button and make sure it's to everyone. Um, because if you just put to the host and panelists, then other people don't know what you asked if you asked a question. So please make sure um, to do that today. There's closed captions, and if there's any security issues or something happens, technical glitch, um, it'll end e immediately, and we will follow up. Okay, so we will be good. Um, good to go. Right, next slide. So welcome, you guys know California Bridge and you know our goal is to take over all of California. So <laughs> that is our goal today. Um, and make sure that our patients have high quality treatment for substance use disorders in all California hospitals. We are almost so close. Um, you know, we're almost at 90% um, taking over California. So we, we're we happy you're here today because you are the result of what's going on in this wonderful movement. And I do call it a movement. We've started and we're not going to stop you guys. So again, we're taking over California. Next slide. So I just wanted to share some numbers. We've gotten our numbers, our impact numbers up to date. So you want to know what California Bridge is up to. Um, this is what we're up to, you guys. You, you guys are working, not me. This is you, the navigators. We've seen over 236,000 people. Um, you guys are amazing. We know you're out there doing a hard, a hard work and you are changing. You're changing people's lives. Um, we've identified 176,000 people with opioid um, use disorder. And this is a wonderful number, 76,000 and MET was prescribed or administered. That's um, our MET program. And of course, we have to mention, because Charles is here, how many naloxone toolkits are ordered. So this is just amazing. You guys are out there spreading the word, spreading the education and saving lives, 153,000. Um, so we're just so excited with all the hard work you've done. This is all congratulations to you and all the hard work, because you're the one that put these numbers up here. So we thank you. Um, and right now, 200 hospitals implemented the bridge model. We're still um, having some in pro progress and we're hoping that number, it should be up to 278 hospitals. So again, we're taking over California, you guys, with your help. So we love this. Right, next slide. So we have some announcements. Before we get started, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that we partnered with, we are partnering with Cypress Reliance Project, and they have offered for all navigators the free mental health first aid certification. It's an eight hour course. It's in one day. It is virtual. And we want to make sure that you guys are aware you can take out your phones and uh, download the QR code. This is the entrance form interest form and this will give us um, your name and how to contact you so if you are interested in the free mental health first aid certification this is a great great tool to put in your uh, for your professional growth so we really highly recommend this a lot of navigators have already taken this but if you haven't it's absolutely free we're having our first course in june um, and then we will also have some courses in July and August. So please sign up if you have not. And one more announcement. Um, next slide. Um, we have talked a lot. If you haven't heard about the return on investment calculator, um, it is on our website, but we will be having a workshop. And um, if you are interested, um, we need to um, reach out and you need to reach out to us and let us know if you are interested in 
plan, uh, attending a workshop. It's a one-page report that illustrates the benefits of making the navigator position a permanent one. So again, if you are interested, contact us at mentors, c at cabridge.org. We're making this very easy and it's demonstrating the value of the navigator. So please, um, just send us an email and we will give you more information. All right, next slide. So these are our objectives today. We're going to keep it all about culture, hospital culture, and how it impacts patient care, explain how a navigator role can influence and change hospital culture. And you're going to have two strategies for shifting hospital culture as a navigator, because we know this is something that you guys are doing every single day when you walk in your hospital. So definitely, we are excited to get this topic started. And so I am not going to take any more of Charles' important time. We have Charles Hawthorne. Um, he is our Equity and Harm Reduction Program Manager. And as I said, he's a always welcome um, event here at Navigator Focus Series in our training. So I really appreciate you today, Charles, because you're a crowd favorite. And so I am just going to let you take control. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sherry. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be here with you. I'm really excited to speak with y'all a little bit more today about changing culture at your hospitals, which arguably is like one of the biggest things that we are doing here at California Bridge is actually changing how hospitals are functioning and, and the ways that people are interacting with each other. So y'all have likely seen this slide before, which is how the California Bridge model is starting to revolutionize the healthcare system. Um, and what that's really about is you have these three different areas that we work on. We have our low barrier treatment, which is, as y'all know, working with doctors to prescribe um, buprenorphine to uh, patients who are coming in and ensuring that people are able to get the care they need. Um, the connection to care and community, which is what Sherry and the mentor team work with y'all so much on. How do you link people to care? How are you continuing this care? Um, when people are coming in, how are you making them feel safe and welcome? And then this third piece, which is a culture of harm reduction. And that is really what we're gonna be focusing on today. So y'all have likely heard me talk a lot about harm reduction and sometimes what it looks like a little bit more in the, in the nitty gritty, what it looks like to be distributing fentanyl test strips, what it looks like to be practicing naloxone distribution, um, all those different things. And today we're gonna kind of go a little bit more meta. We'll be talking a little bit more about how are you actually changing and shifting culture within your hospitals and specifically, what are the opportunities that you have to do that within your limit, within your role as a navigator, recognizing the position that you're in, recognizing the type of power you may hold, um, and being able to, to, to really shift like that, to shift culture in a way that's positive. So just to go ahead and start out, when we talk about culture, what we're really talking about is creating a welcoming culture in the hospital that does not stigmatize substance use, and does recognize racial disparities and access to care. So when a lot of the times, uh, and this is something that I, I'm always happy to have a conversation about. So if at a point during this training, you're kind of like, I actually really want to talk more about this. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'll make sure that my email gets posted in the, in the chat and it's, it'll be in the slide by the end of the slide deck. And I'm happy to talk more about this. But one of the big things I always like to say is that we really can't actually engage patients around substance use if we're also stigmatizing substance use. We're really trying to create a culture that moves away from looking at substance use as bad or good, and instead is just recognizing it as a reality for people who are coming into your care. It is not our jobs as, as, as providers to make judgments about the decisions that people are making in their own lives. Um, and it's also important for us to recognize that there's actually a lot of disparities and differences in the ability people have to access care that is going to be able to help them manage their relationships to drugs and, and improve their health. And so what we're really looking to do is promote harm reduction and trauma-informed practices. So being able to really move with the knowledge um, and practices that are informed by thought, schools of thought that are understand that trauma is a real thing that people face and are seeking to improve um, the health of people and offer people as many options as possible to be healthy um, in the decisions that they make. And also, well, the reason that we want to do this is we really want to build trust um, through these human interactions and, and lead with respect. 
Um, respect is always such an interesting concept when, we, when we're talking about the, the hospital care environment, because, you know, sometimes when we're talking about it, I think it can be, I, I think that people oftentimes are like, well, we need people to respect us as patients. And I think that um, where I usually sit with that is that's something that we build. And I think a lot of times when people are coming into access care at our hospitals, they do have a lot of preconceived notions that are informed by their experiences often with the healthcare system. And so it is actually on us as the people who work in these systems to, to do the work of, um, of, of building that bridge of extending that olive branch and really trying to build connections with people and lead with respect so that people feel comfortable and, and, and interested in sharing what they're going through and we're able to support them as best we can um, with the knowledge and the tools that we bring. So the first thing that's important for us to kind of ground ourselves in as we, kind, as we engage in, in thinking about drug-related stigma is really talking about what is stigma. Um, so a lot of the times when I talk about stigma, what comes to mind for people is it's kind of something just bad. It's a bad thing we think about somebody. It's an offensive thing. It's a stereotype. And that's all true. And I think the thing is that really helps me understand stigma and, and really ground myself in the way that it exists within our world is, is this definition, which comes from um, the National Harm Reduction Coalition. This was a guide that I actually helped write when I was working at NHRC. Um, and the definition that we would use is stigma is a social process that is linked to power and control, which leads to creating stereotypes and assigning labels to those that are considered deviant from the norm or behave, quote unquote, badly. So when we say something is a social process, what we're really talking about is something much bigger than an individual moment. We're talking about how in the world and how in the way that our society functions, what role does stigma play? So I'd love for you to come into the chat and I'd love for a few people to maybe just name, what are some reasons that people might stigmatize people who use drugs? Who benefits? when people who use drugs are stigmatized. Yeah, fear, fear is a result, unknowing. People stigmatize because they don't know what's going on, because they're scared. Who are the people who benefit when we stigmatize people who use drugs? Hmm. So a lot of people are saying no one, okay. Alicia said private prisons, okay, yeah. So that's one way to start thinking about it. So from a perspective of getting better care, nobody benefits when we're talking about stigmatizing people who use drugs. From a hospital perspective, patients are getting worse care, providers are showing up and being confused. They don't know what's going on. They're experiencing a lot of fear and unknowing. Um, and it makes it really hard for you to engage with your patients. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of distrust, a lot of dishonesty that makes it hard for providers, both navigators and physicians and nurses to be able to offer the care that they need. Um, and that makes it really hard to do our work. So within the, 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 the world of the hospital system and the people receiving and providing the care, nobody really benefits from stigma. But when we blow it up a little bit more and we think about the role that stigma plays in the world, there's lots of people who benefit. We're talking about things like the, the private like prison system, where people who benefit from people being locked up for drug use and being arrested for things related to drugs. We're talking about a capitalistic environment that, that uh, is making money off of churning people in and out of the system who benefit off of things like poverty, who benefit off of things like homelessness, who benefit off of things like people having to pay for um, going to treatment, pay for uh, to get out of jail, pay to get care again and again and again and again because they aren't getting quality care the first time. And so a lot of times when we're thinking about really pushing, pushing back on stigma and dismantling stigma, I think for the root of it, it goes beyond even some kind of like in our heads, like I wanna be a better person and I wanna be nicer to people. I want people to get better care, that's great. But actually what we're also doing is we're really talking about how are we shifting the way that me as a provider and this patient as a person are interacting with this world and how are we interrupting these systems that have been set up to really criminalize people and put them in a place where they don't have power and to really push people who are deviant away. And because I, and I think one of the things that I always really link to that 
is thinking about what drugs are stigmatized and which drugs aren't. Thinking about the ways that a drug like crack is stigmatized differently than a drug like cocaine. Thinking about the ways that, um, you know, I, I always think about a drug like cannabis. So out here in California, you know, there's some different relationships to cannabis than, you know, the rest of the world. Um, I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. In Indiana, cannabis is still very, 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 very stigmatized. It is very, still very, very, very illegal. You can still get arrested for carrying an eighth or a quarter of, 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 of weed on you, which is something that would not happen in a place like Oakland right now, which is something that would not happen in most of California right now um, because it's legal. Um, and so thinking about how these things are really dependent on where you are in the world and, and who you're around really highlights the fact that stigma isn't actually about health. It's not actually about what's right or wrong. It's really about who is holding the power and who are they saying is okay to engage with these substances? Who are they saying is okay to um, continue in this, to, 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 to engage with this process and get what they need? Um, and the people who aren't deserving of that, which oftentimes are people of color, people who are poorer, people who are not from this country, people who don't have access to the same structural power. A lot of the times, those are the folks who they're pushing to other or to be scared of or for us to be afraid of. And when we really push through that fear and we say, instead of me being scared, instead of me resting on unknowing, I'm gonna choose to engage. I'm gonna choose to learn. I'm gonna choose to lead with curiosity. That is really what disrupting stigma is all about. And so how, how we really get to start disrupting stigma is I think it kind of moves ahead with, um, yeah, how you really move ahead with, uh, with, the, with these pieces is by kind of breaking down the way that stigma develops. So a lot of times when we talk about stigma, we start with things like stereotypes um, or ideas. And so I, I tell this story sometimes, my mom doesn't always like when I tell it, but I tell it anyway. I would remember um, when I was uh, maybe eight or nine years old and me and my mom would be walking around the city and we would come across somebody who was homeless. And I remember one time my mom turned to me and pointed at this person who was unhoused and said, see, that's what happens if you don't do your homework. And that's an idea. We don't know anything about that person's life. We don't know anything about what got that person there, but there's an idea that's planted even for young people, for children, for people when you begin to work in the hospital, the things that you hear, the things that you're told, these ideas and stereotypes that are sat with you that tell you this is what you're told to think about this person or this situation. And these ideas come into your brain. And that's how we learn is through these ideas. And those ideas establish into belief. And so these beliefs are things that we hold, these ways that we see these worlds, these lenses that we put on that make us see the world in a different way. And those are what we would call prejudices, these prejudgments that we make about people based on what we see, based on what we know, based on how we kind of filter the world out. And what happens is those beliefs lead to our actions. And those actions are what we would describe as discrimination. So for example, if I'm thinking about being told that people who don't do their homework end up being, being unhoused, the belief that I might have is people who are unhoused are lazy, or stupid or don't know what they're doing. And therefore actions that I might take is when somebody is coming to access care from me, if I don't think that they're willing to do the work, if I don't think they're willing to, to step up, I'm just like, you're just, you're just lazy. I'm not even gonna, if you don't wanna put the effort in, I'm not gonna put the effort in, which might lead to that person actually not getting quality care. And there's lots of ways that this shows up for people who use drugs, where we might have these stereotypes that we hear all the time, that we hear from our colleagues, that we hear from our friends, that we hear from our families, that we witness in TV shows and books and movies, but that tell us over and over again that people who use drugs are criminals, they're untrustworthy, and they're dangerous. We have these prejudices that we both develop that say people who use drugs are refusing to help themselves, they're never going to change, this is just who they are. And what this might mean is in our actions, there's contempt, there's anger, there's upsetness, there's impatience that comes up when we begin to engage with people who use drugs. 
which might mean when we're working in an emergency department and there's a patient who's, a, who's navigating opioid withdrawal waiting in the lobby, you might just be like, well, there's people here who have heart attacks. There's people here who broke bones, who this is not something they can control. So you can wait in this waiting room a little bit longer and be uncomfortable um, because that's, that's what you did on your set. Or denying people medications like buprenorphine. Um, uh, buying people medications like buprenorphine, um, which are medications that are going to help alleviate these symptoms, but not being interested in prescribing it because that's cheating or that's not really being sober and that's the only way that people are supposed to go. And so ultimately, um, this really shifts. The, the, this is what it looks like for people to be stigmatized within the hospital setting is for, for these small, these beliefs and these stereotypes that sometimes we feel like are so disconnected from these actions, but in reality are very, very rooted in them. And this really matters for a lot of reasons. So for example, patients are more likely to leave against medical advice when they're not, when they're being stigmatized. We, we found that patients with substance use disorder are three times more likely to be discharged with against medical advice than those who don't have substance use disorder. And I think that's really important to name, especially because every time a patient leaves against medical advice, they are more at risk. When people are leaving and they're not stabilized, when they don't have the medications and the support that they need, when they are feeling sick, when they're leaving because they are in withdrawal and they're not accessing care, that person is more at risk to be experiencing an overdose when they leave that hospital. They are more likely to be in a situation that is going to put them at risk for death, for injury, and for disease because, because we are not adequately helping meet their needs. And that is not a good thing. Um, an additional thing that really comes up against this is patients are more likely to have to come back again and again and again. When patients come in and they're being stigmatized, um, they are going to not get the care that they need. And oftentimes, you know, what we see, what often the story that many of y'all see in hospitals is patients who come in, they don't want to come in, but the emergency department is the only place that they're able to access care because that's the only place that you're able to come and get care when you might not be able to afford it, when maybe you don't have insurance, when you maybe don't have um, access to a primary care provider but they come into the emergency department, maybe they get some fluids, maybe they get a little something to help them feel better. And then they're discharged without medication, without naloxone, without anything, which means they're gonna come right back to this hospital when they are having another trouble. Instead of getting everything they need, instead of getting all of their needs addressed um, in that visit. And so being able to work on changing our hospital culture to provide better care and better care that is, anti, that is really rooted on an anti-stigma um, and in doing that anti-stigmatizing work is going to actually reduce the amount of patients that are going to be coming and returning to your hospital again and again and again. So people are more likely to come and stay and get the care that they need, and they'll be less likely to come back because they will have gotten the care that they need, which ultimately, you know, um, they are talking about that return on investment worksheet um, that, that they're having that webinar for. I think that's a really great tool. I've seen it be used in action, and it's incredibly impressive. And I think one of the biggest things that comes from it is for all of you navigators out there who are sometimes a little concerned about like, am I making an impact? Am I shifting things? I really encourage you to do this worksheet because what we see when people do this return on investment worksheet is that patients that sometimes prior to seeing this navigator were coming into the hospital for multiple days a month to get the same type of care. And after actually engaging with a navigator who was able to meet them where they were at give them the care that they need and ensure that they had everything to, in order to feel better, the amount of visits that that patient had went down. Their visits became shorter. They were getting what they needed. And so they were able to get those things handled and go. And that is the value that navigators bring to, our, to, bring to the system in terms of really helping people get care and not just be kind of left in the lurch around these things. And I think just really to nail it down and saying every time a patient leaves against medical advice, that is a that is a threat to your patient's life. That is not where we want to be. This is not a win. I think sometimes I've witnessed this in 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 nursing and in, in physician circles and and navigators sometimes where like patients that are really getting on your nerves and they leave EMA and you're just like screw it, go, you can get out. 
And, and we really want to push against that. We really don't want to move with that energy. That is not a celebratory moment. We want patients to be happy and safe and feel as comfortable as possible in our hospital setting so that they're able to get the care that they need. Because if patients are leaving against medical advice, that is because they are not getting something that they need most of the time. And that is when it comes, especially when it comes to things like substance use, um, it's, 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 it's really dangerous. And I'm seeing people in the chat who are kind of, um, that, that, that are, 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 are really agreeing with this. I'm saying, uh, John said, I've noticed that if people have a history of leading AMA, there's less urgency in addressing health issues, less effort from providers to assess and refer to adequate services. And I think this is a huge place where navigators are able to actually start to push back on the hospital culture and be able to say, no, let's get this person what they need. What they're asking for is a blanket. We can get them a blanket. What they're asking for as a medic is that they're feeling really sick. We have a medication that can fix that. Give it to them. We don't have to do this back and forth and this pretending that we have to kind of be the gatekeepers of, of care. We can give people care. That's why we're here. That's why we're there to support and really, and, and really leaning into that. Um, and then Jeffrey's agreeing and saying so often people stop caring because they just assume a patient's going to leave AMA anyway. And it creates a vicious cycle of uh, pay, uh, pay people not getting care, leaving AMA, coming back, rinse and repeat. So yes, let's really talk about interrupting cycles and really shifting cultures so that we're not experiencing this again and again and again. And we're really talking about a new standard of care. You know, we're really talking about shepherding in a brand new world and really changing the way that, um, really changing the way that, uh, that hospitals are, are functioning within the US and in California. This is, this is different. And it's gonna be shifts for your, for your provider teams. It's gonna be a shift for you maybe, um, but that's okay because that's the great thing about uh, learning new things. And it's a great thing about experiencing new worlds as we get to try different things and do things differently and, and hopefully learn things that work better in the process. Ooh, okay. So let's talk about taking some action. What are some intentional interventions that we can do to start shifting culture? So first and foremost, we can talk about the impact of healthcare providers um, and, and thinking about how historical experiences have kind of affected current practice. Um, and these are some of these things that people have named already. These feelings of resentment and frustration when patients are coming and leaving AMA and, and not getting the care that they need and, and just kind of going. Um, feeling really frustrated about that and resentful about that, especially when people have been trying to maybe do really good care and one time it doesn't really work out. Uh, and then uh, feel, learning the, these learned behaviors, thinking about a lot of the times the, the guild and practice of, of medicine and nursing and the way that people learn from people who have been practicing longer than them or at hospitals before them. Um, and so you learn. And I think a lot of times there's been uh, what I would call uh, bad behaviors that have been passed on. Behaviors of, of, of not caring, behaviors of disengagement, and really having to push back on those. Um, language choices, words that we use to prefer to patients, um, and also moral injury. Sometimes feeling like um, do you, your values feel hurt. Like I'm trying to do all these things for this good person and they don't care about me, so why should I care about them? And, and all of those kind of come together and in, in naming these pieces a part of how these pieces really come together to form our thoughts and um, that shape our feelings and our actions that create these barriers to care. So these influences, this moral these moral injury and our own experiences, our own beliefs, every single person on this call could probably tell a story about their own relationship to substance use growing up, whether it was their own substance use, the substance use of a friend or a family member, substance use in their neighborhood or in their community, and the way that it shaped their own experiences and beliefs, and led to a lot of the times the stigma and discrimination that leads to the actual barriers of care. So the question becomes, how do we change the narrative? How do we begin to shift this situation and shift this cycle to being better? And I think one of the biggest ways we're able to do it is starting by addressing the stigma and discrimination and creating this positive culture change in healthcare. And there's a few ways to do that. 
Um, and I'm gonna kind of walk through these. And one is recognizing one's own bias. So when we talk about recognizing one's own bias, I think that the fact that you really need to ground yourself in and that we all should ground ourselves in when we're going out and doing this work is that substance use disorder is a medical condition that requires medical treatment. For so long, we have talked about substance use and substance use disorder as this thing that exists somehow within and outside of the medical structure. It's something that feels a lot more theoretical. It's something that's a lot more moral. It's a moral problem. It's a mental problem. It's an everything's problem. It's everybody else's problem, but the person who's being asked to deal with it. And I will say when we're talking about hospitals and when we're talking about um, substance use disorder, it is a medical treatment that requires medical treatment. It is a medical condition that requires medical treatment. And the action that we can take is to begin to identify and recognize the beliefs that you hold related to a substance use disorder. And one way that I really like to do this, which is hard, but I think it's actually really effective, is when people start telling you stuff like this, there's gonna be a little voice in the back of your head that's gonna be saying something like, no, it's not, it's actually this, or no, it's not, it's actually this, or you're wrong, Charles, you don't know what you're talking about. And I really encourage you to connect with that voice. When that voice is saying, people who use, this isn't real, people who use buprenorphine are, they're just cheating. They don't really wanna be sober. They just wanna use this. Really put, talk, engaging with that voice and saying, why do I think that? Why do I think that somebody coming in and getting a medication that's gonna alleviate their symptoms and allow them to live a bit more of a fruitful and regulated life? What's wrong with that? What is the thoughts that are coming up for me? And where are these thoughts coming from? What is the, the, the challenge that I'm having or that with, with, this, with this idea um, that's making me have this bell ring off in my head that it doesn't feel quite right? And so much we're taught to, and I think especially even in trainings like this, we're kind of taught to um, uh, and uh, we're taught to just kind of ignore that bell or just say like, oh no, we're, everything's gonna be great. We just need to act right. And actually we kind of need to learn those things because when we're the most stressed, when we're dealing with our most difficult patients, when we're in the most difficult situations, that's the time that our biases are gonna come out the most strong. And we need to be able to be in a place that we can push back on those and name those beliefs. And I one of the ways that I really encourage this is to build community. Really, if, when you, if you have other navigators in your area, if you have other navigators in your hospital system, really engage with each other around these ideas. Talk to each other about the challenges that you have with patients and the challenges and beliefs that you're holding around substance use disorder. Talk to your mentors um, in, the, in the California Bridge team. Talk to me. Talk to your, your implementation leaders and your champions and really start to build a conversation where we feel comfortable being able to name when these biases are coming up. Because the more that we talk about them, the more that we're able to actually process through them and grow. And that's what actually makes us better workers and that's what actually makes us um, better caretakers. Yeah, and, and, and I think we're seeing all these other ways where it comes to, of like Jeffrey naming, it's frustrating when certain treatment centers don't accept patients because they're on mat. And all these other biases that come up when we're even trying to refer people out, how frustrating that can be. And really rooting ourselves. So this is actually nothing wrong with these patients. And there's nothing wrong with this treatment mechanism. But it is something wrong with the system that we're operating within. And really, another piece that I always like to talk about is how conversations and culture are so connected. And the way that we talk about things always is going to influence the way that culturally we move around these different topics. And so the other thing that we really like to talk about is how are you being a communication role model? And what I really like to say is the words that you use to communicate, um, the words you use communicates both how much you care about your patients and also how much you know. And the question that I have for y'all is, what are you communicating when you use words like, like crackhead or junkie or addict or addiction? What are you saying to your patients about how much you care and how much you know? What are some of the things that come to mind for you? You're contributing to the stigma, so you're, you're not interested in, in, in interrupting it. You're labeling them. You're saying that's what you are and that's what you're going to be. 
you're judging. So you're there's there's the judgmental piece that's coming out. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I'm not gonna touch that one, but um I'll say working on it. Um Lenitra said, you don't care what happens to them. Um, yeah, I think that, that and I think that, that feels really powerful. And I and I just want to really root, you know, I think a lot of people, especially within our navigator group, are people who have experienced medical stigma, are people who have experienced going to their doctor, the emergency department, a primary care provider, and have felt what it feels like to not be heard, has felt what it feels like to not be cared about. And, and when we're when we are on the other side of that, thinking about how are we pushing back on that and doing that work to not judge or define or label people is huge. And I think, and, and uh, Lisa added, you don't see them as a human being. You're, you're, you're dehumanizing. This isn't even a patient I'm talking to, it's just the thing. And so we're really, and I, and I really like to, this is a slide that I also use a lot when I'm talking to medical students as well, um, because I think so much like medical students who are coming in, really just an opportunity. And I think especially if you're, if you're, if you work with any young um, doctors or young uh, nurses who are in your building, this is especially a place to begin to with having these conversations because interrupting it early helps a lot. And really saying, if you're trying to come across as a professional, if you're trying to come across as somebody who knows their shit and knows how to talk to patients, one of the best ways to do it is by using accurate and clear language that doesn't carry any moral judgments about the people who we're talking about. Speaking with compassion and a willingness to support, saying I am here to care for you, not to judge you, not to push a behavior about you, and using person-first language. And I like person-first language because it's less stigmatizing, but also because it is more clear and it is more precise. Every person who uses drugs is not a drug addict. Every person who uses drugs does not even have substance use disorder. So when we're saying someone who has substance use disorder, say this person has substance use disorder. When somebody uses drugs, say this person uses drugs. When this somebody uses meth, say this person uses meth. If they are using meth chaotically, you can say their meth use is a bit chaotic. We can name things and be descriptive and not lean on these words that are rooted in all of this moral judgment and these connotations that are really, really bad. We can instead really lean into words that are more specific and accurate. And so the actions that we're really talking about is moving towards these terms that are more specific. This person uses this specific drug. This person is in recovery. This person had a negative result for this substance in their urine. This person had a positive result for this in their urine. Instead of term terms that are things like, you know, like I named addict, abuser, junkie, alcoholic, drunk, um, saying someone is in recovery as opposed to saying they're an ex addict or they're a former alcoholic, who you're still labeling them. You're talking about what they were as opposed to the process that they are in. Um, the concept of somebody being a drug seeker. We are in a very pharmacologically heavy medical system. Most people who are coming to access medical care are seeking some sort of substance. Um, some of those substances are more criminalized or stigmatized than others, but, like, but calling somebody a drug seeker is not helpful and does not actually get to the root of what somebody is going through. Moving away from terms like clean or dirty is really... Um, are, are is really I think huge as well. It's a lot of moral judgments that it that carries with it. Um, the term frequent flyer, yeah, Roger. I think that that's like a real one, and I think that that's a good place to kind of interrupt. And I and I think one of the ways that I kind of interrupted that piece before is really saying like, wow, if they've been here a lot. They probably haven't been getting. We probably haven't been doing a good job meeting their needs. Um, which I think is probably gonna be a little bit confrontational and also really speaks to the ways that we're caring for patients and saying, if this person is coming back again and again and again, it probably means that they are not getting the care that they need. And how can we shift that this time? And it is kind of ironic to call urine clean. That is, that's kind of, that is real, but you know, that is, it is actually a sterile, uh, one of the more sterile bodily products that we, uh, that we uh, put out. Um, and then also moving away from terms, I, I actually don't like the term addiction at all. I think it's one of those things that we can kind of like move out of our lexicon as like providers in general, because I think it carries too much power and too much weight at this point. Um, and I think it really speaks to what is more the interaction of a mental and 
sociological and biochemical disorder that's really, really complicated that we are not always in a place to actually diagnose. And so what we can speak to is somebody having a relationship to a substance that is disordered, which is substance use disorder. But addiction, I feel like is really big. And so it's a term that I just choose not to use as much as possible, um, just because it, it doesn't feel like clear language. Yeah, and then Katie added some additional pieces. Like I prefer calling needles or syringes new or used versus clean or dirty. And I love that because it's really talking about this needle was made dirty by the person who uses it. Um, and that's exactly right. We're, we're, we're trying to move away from describing a person as dirty. And I think also when we talk about clear language, that's huge because what we're really saying is we also want these needles to be sterile that people are using. Um, because um, when, when you talk about clean or dirty, there's also an idea that you can clean a dirty needle. And that's not really something that is um, a reality for most people who are using substances on the street. You could get a sterile needle and really thinking about needle is sterile or it is not. And that's also in a big way communicating with people how their substance use should, how you can help their substance use be even better. Um, and Latoya added this piece when uh, doing our in training at the hospital, I would say, even if a patient uses stigmatizing terms for themselves, always use person first language, yeah. So people might have their own ideas about themselves, their own identities and their own ways that they describe themselves. And that is not our job to put onto them. And we, we can use, uh, we, and I think that that's a place where we can not mirror language and instead give people a different way to see themselves. And I think especially that feels so powerful for me because in seeing the ways that people have shifted their relationships to substance use, I think one of the most powerful thing that we can do for people is really give them a way to see themselves that is outside of where they are at in that moment. You might be a person who is experiencing substance use disorder right now, but there is also a moment where you could not be experiencing substance use disorder. If you're a drunk, there's this connotation that you're always going to be a drunk. If you're an addict, there's this connotation that you will always be an addict. And really what we're talking about is these are things that can shift and change oftentimes very quickly for people. Um, and we want to give them the space to do that. And so what that really looks like for us is also this piece of being intentional. And um, the fact is, is it's really easy to like kind of continue doing the same thing. You know, a lot of the times um, people describe healthcare as, as like trying to turn a yacht. Um, it takes a long, long time. And it is much easier to keep going in the same direction than to turn that big old boat. But you know, we are California Bridge and we have taken on turning the yacht. So I hope that y'all hop on there and help turn it right along with us. Um, and it's and that's something you encounter a lot of that people just doing the same thing because of habit, because of comfort, because that's the way it's always been done. Um, and, and we really break this pattern by making intentional choices, making intentional decisions, being intentional with the words we use, being intentional with the actions we take with how we show up for people, with really taking opportunities, with saying, this patient has been here 17 times this year. How can I do something different this time? What can shift? What is a different way that I can approach this interaction that might give me a different result? And be creative with it. Not feel like we have to do the same thing over and over again, just because that's the way it's been done. We can, and, and that's the great point of being a, a human and being somebody who's showing up here as a human is we can do things differently and we can make that choice every single time. And who knows, maybe you make a different choice next time and you figure something out. And I think something that also feels really powerful is when we, we're all people and we're all different, which means we get to show up differently with clients. I'm, um, I'm sure that when all of you talk to your colleagues, the way that you talk to clients, the way you show up in your bedside, how you kind of show up with people is different based but then your other navigators. Maybe it's different patient to patient. Something that I found very often when I was working in certain service programs is I had a different way of engaging with young people than I did with engaging with older people. I had a different way of engaging with uh, black people as I did with non-black people. I had a different way of engaging with people who were queer than people who were not queer because of the different communities that I sit in, because of the different ways that I am able to engage with folks. And really taking advantage of that and really thinking about 
how do I show up in this system and in this space? And how can I help this person feel as comfortable and as happy as possible? And that is huge. And then the last piece I really wanted to talk about of how we can really begin to, sh to, to, be in, to shift this work is normalize care. And really coming back to this piece that, that substance use disorder and addiction is a, is a chronic disease that requires medical treatment. And substance use disorders should be treated with best practice recommendations like any other condition we treat. And we know the best practices. If you don't know those best practices, go back and read your Navigator Toolkit. Uh, go back and read our, our guide to, to implementing the bridge program in, in, um, in your hospital. But there are best practices. There's prescribing bup, there's connecting with patients in the ED, and there's referring them to ongoing care. They're insur there's ensuring that they have naloxone. There's ensuring there's, they're educated about overdose when they're, going, when they're going back out into the world. These are the best practices. This is what we've learned works the best and saves people's lives. And really leaning into that is, 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 is huge. And normalizing that care and unnormalizing denying people that care, making it awkward. When a provider is saying that they don't want to do something, telling them that they should note that, that that is something that they are choosing to do, that they're making the option to not go along with that care. And making sure that you are engaging your champion and engaging provide providers, especially at doctors and nurses in your hospital, who, who care about this work, who, who are on your team, on your bridge team, and pushing them to also hold those conversations, pushing them to push to, to hold their colleagues accountable as well. Because we no patient should be suffering and be getting inadequate care just because of the way that things have always been done. That's unacceptable. So Gerald asks if they, if patient admits they are dependent, is it okay to use the word that word dependency? Um, I think that it feel I think that that's a great question, and I think it kind of depends. And I think that a lot of the times, what I would say is really asking them when they're saying they're dependent, asking what does dependent mean to you, and and getting more specific and, and learning about that because I think that the short I think that that's one of those things that we learn about shorthand so much in our world when we say when we use a term like drugs, we use a term like addiction or dependence, even though we might have an idea that everybody has the same way of thinking about that term, it actually might not be true. There actually might be lots of different ways that people describe that term. So, and I think that it's okay to use words. I don't think this is necessarily about saying you should absolutely never, ever, 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 ever say this word. And if you do, I'm going to come out of the heavens and smite you. I think what it's really about is getting curious. And it's really about not leaning on shorthand and instead of really leaning into having a conversation and being curious and learning more about what people are talking about within their experiences. And so some of these takeaways, changing hospital culture is not just important, it's really essential. This is really the work that we are here to do. Um, and so let's make sure that we are really taking the space and time to do it. Um, there are steps that you can take to change your own behavior. There's ways that you can begin to shift this work and doing the best that you can. And, and there's ways, there's limits that you're also gonna have within your role. But you can always start with you in the way that you show up. And, and you can be a leader in your ED. People talk about all the time. And I, you know, I've gone and done site visits at these hospitals. I've gone and talked to a lot of the, the doctors and providers you work with. And let me tell you, even though you might not feel that way, people are looking at you and they're looking at you as a role model. They're looking at you as a person who's coming in and doing this work. They're seeing you as a person who's a lot of the times a lot more effective at doing it than they are. They're appreciating you. And, and they're looking to you to see how, how should I be acting? and How should I be showing up? Even if they're not always totally conscious of it. So really thinking about just like, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, I have younger sisters and that's something that my parents will always say to me is like, your sisters are watching you. They're looking to see what are you doing? Looking to see how you act, looking to see how you handle situations and they're learning from that. And so making sure that when you're in that space, that you are showing up in the way that you want people to emulate, that you want people to, 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 to follow um, as much as possible. All right, so I am gonna, I would say we're gonna do Q&A real quick. So feel free to go ahead and put some questions in the group chat. 
while I'm doing that, I just wanted to give one update for people who were not on our, our meth update last month. And that's saying that there's a very, very important fentanyl test strip update. Um, pay attention to the type of test strip that you're using and making sure you're following the correct instruction because there are new test strips. Um, these new test strips come from an organization called Dance Safe. They have developed a new test strip that is much more effective at um, detecting uh, doses of fentanyl and they have no known false positives. One of the big things we had to educate people on when we were using the old test strips was that uh, they had a false positive for methamphetamine um, and, and ecstasy, Molly um, or MDMA. And so uh, being able to not have those false positives are huge, but there is a bit more of a precise testing procedure. So make sure you learn more about that. Um, so Chaya just posted in the group chat, um, this guide prevent overdose with fentanyl test strips. This guide is updated. It includes the instructions for both the old test strips, which come in the green pack from BTNX, as well as the new test strips um, from Dance Safe. So I would just say, make sure you're paying attention to the type of test strip you're using. Make sure you are communicating with your patients. If you get a new type of test strip, then you've been giving them. And if you're interested in ordering some test strips for your hospital, reach out to me and I can connect you. Um, California Bridge and Conejo Health want to help. Um, so I, I know Matt Paul is on this call, our wonderful partner from Conejo Health, who um, has been doing a, a lot of work to make sure that hospitals can start out with this. So uh, Conejo Health has graciously, graciously agreed um, to be a bit of a Kickstarter and, and fund hospitals to get a starter kit of these new strips if they're interested. So if you're interested in getting that, email me and I can, I can help you get a starter kit um, just to get you going for now. Um, and then at last, it, we are also doing another big push to get more hospitals to distributing naloxone. So if you haven't started distributing naloxone at your hospital or you wanna learn more about doing it, feel free to scan this um, and you can access our guide to naloxone distribution. Um, also a quick update on that, the DHCS will be switching to using an online form um, beginning at the beginning of July. So we actually will have an update coming out on this guide in the next month that will have all the new instructions for that. Um, so more things to come, all these things moving and shaking at California Bridge. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and really, really quickly um, go through some Q&A. Uh, Latoya, did you have any the questions that came out? Um, Charles, I'm going to interrupt real second. This is Sherry. I wanted, I, I, I received a question um, prior to this to this um, webinar um, with the new fentanyl test strips, do they have to use the same amount? Well, a lot of navigators express concern that a lot of their patients do not want to use the fentanyl um, test strips because it uses their, their you know, product. And they mm -hmm. do, you know, they have enough just for them and they don't want to mm -hmm. use them to test. Are these similar in the amount that they have to test? Yes. Um, so one big piece of advice, though, is depending on how you're using the drug, you have different options. So if you are going to be injecting the, medic, the, 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 the substance, you can use, still can actually use that substance as well. So what you can do is uh, just use that same liquid in order to inject. If you're going to be snorting or smoking it, one option that you have is actually to either just wait for the water to evaporate um, and scrape it up. Um, out of like the metal cap, or you can actually like just warm it up in the oven to just like uh, kind of uh, evaporate the water and reuse the product. So the process does not destroy the product. It might be a little bit more work to harvest it um, afterwards. Another option that I can also put forward for that is if somebody is ordering a good amount of product, something that they can do is just make sure that they mix it up really well. If you're using like a powder or a rock, grind it up as well as you can, mix it up really well so you can do your best to get an even sample and then sample just a piece of it. And that won't give you totally accurate information because you're not testing the whole thing, of course, but it'll give you a more accurate um, a more accurate rating and it'll allow you to not use your entire amount of product in that testing process. Um, and I will say that like some people also won't wanna do it at all because they don't wanna waste their product and, and that's their choice and their prerogative to make. And, and an option that they also have is by just starting with less. So encouraging people who are not trying to use a test strip is just encouraging them to start with a very, very small amount of their substance and see how it makes them feel. Um, and that will be able to help them be in a place where like, you know, if you're using meth, 
and you use a little bit of your meth and you get more sleepy, that might be a sign that your meth has some, some, some fentanyl in it and you can kind of make a decision according to that. Great. That's a great question though. Thank I you, Sherry. Thank you. I know uh, somebody, I, I don't know if they're on the call and I just want, I know if one person has that question, I know a lot of people are out there have that same question. For sure, for sure. So for thank sure. you because I had no clue that they could still use it, you know, let, that that's great information any other questions out there this is your time yes this is your time with charles we have a few more minutes um i can while you guys are thinking um th there's something in the chat about don't get dan safe fentanyl test kits off amazon because they're counterfeit mm -mm. Not only oh uh, yeah i would say there's a lot of counterfeits out there as far as test strips there's a lot of counterfeits and most of them are not verified. This is a very exact science. This is not like some backwoods type stuff. You really want to make sure you're getting quality ones, which means right now what I would encourage is either purchasing them directly from DanceSafe, or um, if you're interested in getting the starter kit through Conejo Health, reach out to me. So you can email me at chawthorne at cabridge.org. I think that Lutoya and Chaya have put my email in the chat a couple of times. Um, and I can send you a link to order a starter kit. And then moving forward, you can also continue to order them through Conejo Health, who we have, who uh, we've built a direct relationship to Dance Safe with. But I would not order these on Amazon. I would not go through any back channel means, even from the same company, because they're just not validated in the same way. Um, and so, really sticking with the Dance Safe and Conejo Health ones are going to be your best bet. Um, also, one other thing, I got a question about this before around xylazine test strips. Um, I did an update on xylazine. I think that that might have gotten emailed out um, that I did with uh, Dr. Gonzalez um, and Dr. Trotsky Sir um, the other week. And one of the things that I did mention on that was xylazine test strips are not effective and not validated at this point. We have no evidence seeing that they're actually helpful um, in detecting a meaningful amount of xylazine. So I would avoid spending your money on that as well. And if you have any questions about that, you are always welcome to email me and set up some time on during my office hours to chat more about this. I am here to support y'all on all these questions. Um, and if like I get 50 people hitting me up, then we'll just schedule a meeting and talk about it. And I can give you all the information there. Oh, thank you. You're so helpful. I, I really appreciate this. I know everybody loves when you're here. So I'm really glad this is a, a really good informative session. And we, if you have more questions, um, please, you know, reach out to us. We want to remind all of our trainings are on now our new CA Bridge Academy. It is an online learning management system. So if you're not connected with that, please reach out on our website. Um, we also have a link um, on our Navigator landing page. So again, our trainings are all there. You can see prior trainings of Charles. He's on there as well. So it's again, <laughs> it's a great place to go and you can pick and choose what trainings you want. Contact us and the mentors at mentors at cabridge.org. It's just really simple. We want things simple for you. Next slide, I think is the Navigator team. If if you have you don't know your mentor or you need a mentor let us know mentors at cabridge.org we have many mentors available to help you in your ter your region um they're set up by region so please reach out and last slide it should be charles information if you guys want to reach out and charles if there is a link perhaps we can send that on our post event email for those fentanyl um, starter kits. So that way um, people will get that information. Um, we will send an event, um, post event email with our evaluation. Please fill it out. That helps us. And if you have any other future topics you want to discuss or we need to bring Charles back. So let us know. Um, you know, we, we're so happy you're here and thank you for all you do. We know you are making a difference. I, that's, I loved all of the, your guys's comments and your best practices. You guys are doing this work. So keep up the awesome job and thank you, Charles. We always love having you here. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. I really appreciate you.